Good morning. Um, I am actually really delighted to be here and I know that there's quite a few of you out there who were on my flight from Sydney last night who are also really happy to be here at all. Um, it was kind of a typical Qantas story because we were boarding and then we were on the bus and there was no crew and then we were back to the terminal, then we were back to the plane, then we were off the bus and our bags were loaded and then our plane changed and our bags were unloaded and then we were on the bus and then we were back to the terminal. Anyway, it's quite the experience so I know we're all really happy to be here. Um, before I start, I just want to also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're on as well because particularly they have looked after this land for many thousands of years and I think as we go in this sustainability journey, um, we all have a lot to learn from them. Um, so Jason, thank you very much for the invitation to join you here today. Um, I imagine you probably feel like I do, um, like you're hearing about nothing else these days except for sustainability and decarbonization. It's certainly a huge topic and a very important one. Um, and I have to really congratulate MLA for being leaders in this space and really putting um, this topic very much on the agenda for Australian agriculture. Um, so why am I here talking to you today? Um, look, I'm not a career-long sustainability expert, um, but I do spend a lot of my time, a lot of my day job, unfortunately not in the paddocks, um, but in the boardroom focusing on these issues. So hopefully I can share with you some of the perspectives that I have um, as a result of my various roles that um, I guess are up there on the slide. Um, one thing that's become abundantly clear to me in recent years is that agriculture and food have a, a, actually a very unique role to play in the transition to a low carbon world. Um, and while we as a sector are undoubtedly a major contributor to global emissions, um, sort of somewhere between 20 and 25 percent globally, we're also, and this is the really great part, increasingly the provider of some of the most important solutions. Um, so I just want to start with these two slides, um, which are from people who are experts in this space. Um, the first one is from Scientific American and says, farming is one of the few human activities that can pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it safely. And the second one is from the World Bank, um, which says that nature-based solutions to environmental challenges could deliver 37% of climate change mitigation necessary to meet the global, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and so this is what makes me particularly enthusiastic about the opportunities for the ag sector, particularly here in Australia, um, and I would say, and New Zealand, um, given that, that my board roles sort of go across both countries. Um, I want to start with this slide to lay out, I guess something probably a bit obvious to you, but the ag food value chain um, and how I see that turning into a full sustainability ecosystem. So um, you know the top part, but there's four really key players um, who are actually uh, working as part of this supply chain um, to uh, help manage the transition to low carbon future. Um, the first enabler is obviously finance and investment and I have to say that's particularly important because um, while this sector globally produces a quarter of emissions, only three to four percent of all of the investment dollars today that are going into decarbonization and the transition are coming to this sector. So we're very substantially underinvested in and I know there's a lot of um, people at work um, trying to, to see that increase. Um, obviously innovation, new technologies and solutions are going to be critical. Um, advisory, so those who are experts, um, helping to guide both us as corporates, um, you as primary producers, and um, needless to say governments play a very significant role. Um, and you know, particularly I think in making sure that we have um, a uh, coordinated and fair and just transition. So this slide is sort of, um, I guess what I would call my CV mapped to this value chain ecosystem. Um, but it's also to kind of give you the sense of the sort of perspectives that I bring to this topic. Um, so on the left, I am a uh, Angus beef farmer, but 
a very, very small one. Um, but with my roles between Fonterra and Woolworths, um, I do have pretty good visibility right across that value chain um, from, you know, as we say, paddock to plate. Um, however, I'm also involved in some other roles um, that I think are key. Uh, I was just talking about finance and investment, and ANZ is um, the largest provider today of sustainable financing um, in Australia. Pollination is a company that um, is an advisor uh, to corporates and governments and, and um, lots of different organizations who are trying to chart out their um, sustainability strategy. Um, and Jason referred to Embryo, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is a very early stage technology uh, business that's working on scaling embryo transfer to try to speed up genetic change and, and make that one of our um, uh, possible solutions. So I guess I'll start with sharing my perspectives from the boardroom. Um, so I've been a full-time director now since 2015. Um, so I can confidently say that uh, only a few years ago, the topic of sustainability was one of many on the corporate agenda. And if I'm honest, it was kind of a side issue in most cases, rather than central to business strategy or ops or financial outcomes. Um, but that has all changed absolutely dramatically in the last couple of years. Um, and why is that? Well, um, I suppose none of this is new, but you know, I have to say, for example, shareholders, we go around every year and talk to all of our major shareholders on all of my, um, well, particularly um, the ASX listed companies. Um, and I've recently just been on one of those road shows and climate was the number one topic that they wanted to talk to the board about wasn't our business performance, wasn't our latest results, wasn't um, our strategy, it was our plans for climate. Um, and that is just, you know, uh, a really strong message to boards that that's what our shareholders are interested in. And that's all shareholders, that is mainstream, that's not the leading edge, because what the leading edge ones are doing is they're being activists. And so you saw what happened at AGL, um, coincidentally the Origin Energy AG, uh, AGM is also today, and you can see how the forces of shareholders are, you know, significantly inst influencing what companies are doing. Um, I talked about the influence of money, um, you know, for example, a number of major financial institutions are starting to look sector by sector and have actually banned um, financing to the fossil fuel sector. Um, you know, I'm not so much a favor of such extreme um, uh, positions because uh, these transitions are very, very challenging and um, I don't think, you know, there's black and white answers to how to go about it. Um, but, you know, I can tell you that these guys are not sort of um, making those decisions because, you know, there's a woke agenda in the finance world, um, but it's because there's real risk to them for lending money or investing in companies that don't have clear and cl credible plans to address the risk of climate in their future. So that's what these guys are looking at. It's a financial um, decision they're making. Um, role of government's obviously huge and it's huge from a company perspective because again, you know, we're making big investments all the time and so understanding how government policy is going to influence us. Um, say in sustainability, you know, it, between taxes and tax incentives, governments have played a big role driving our country and others. Um, but, you know, while our own government uh, influences Australia heavily, you know, you're largely an export industry. Um, some of my businesses are largely export businesses. So it's actually overseas governments and the decisions they're making about carbon border taxes and so forth that are affecting us. So um, uh, we live on an island, but we don't live on an island, as you well know. Um, and actually, as board directors, we have uh, fiduciary responsibility for our company, and therefore we do have to understand the risk that climate is presenting to our business, whether it's our own operational risk or the risk of not doing enough or the risk of going too quickly. Um, 
we have to look at the risks, we have to look at the opportunities that are being presented, and those are in many cases very substantial. I'll talk about Fonterra in a minute. Um, but we also, and I think the best companies are looking at how all that plays into our strategy. So um, as you can see, like all the core functions of board directors are now being heavily influenced by external forces um, and, and internal ones that are driving us to look at um, the, the climate transition. And then, it, if just say you were a company who was going to ignore all of that anyway because you didn't believe the climate was changing or you didn't you know, believe in any of this, um, the fact is that mandatory reporting requirements are coming into New Zealand in 2024 and into Australia in 2025. They're sort of global ISSB standards and they're going to require all major companies to report on their emissions, um, report on the amount of capital they're spending to drive the change, um, to report on their risks and their strategy. Um, so this is going to make not only are companies now required to be able to answer and report on all those issues, but we're also more exposed to the risks of doing nothing or over-promising, also known as greenwashing. We're, um, you know, subject to further regulation, to enforcement by the regulators, and, um, you know, there's plenty of examples of litigation. So. Um, that's sort of just a welcome to my world and why board directors are so almost, you know, today obsessively focused on understanding um, the, the impacts and the good ones, I think, the opportunities of, of a changing climate. Um, I guess the other, uh, another big influence on um, what companies do is, is consumer preferences and um, of course uh, as a, particularly as a retailer we have um, some pretty good insights into consumers and what they're thinking and what they're interested in and what they're interested in is climate and nature and provenance and convenience and health and um, the issue in short is that they're just not always that keen to pay for it and particularly in challenging times. Um, but 50% of our customers, which is a pretty, you know, decent uh, coverage of the Australian market, say that care for planet is an important consideration. 50% call it out as an important consideration in their buying purchases, and that has gone up substantially year on year. Um, also, buying local and knowing and understanding um, how products were made or grown or raised or processed um, is one of their top four priorities in terms of making their buying decisions. Um, and health is also of increasing concern and thankfully, um, you know, animal protein is still very much a core part of the Aussie diet and, you know, we, we hope it continues to be so. But um, increasingly, the consumer's definition of value means that uh, there, yes, you know, a lot of these contribute to sort of a premium product today, but over time, and especially as younger consumers get older and have more influence, um, these will become threshold considerations. They'll become expectation, and over time, you know, as with many things, they're premium in the early days, and then they become sort of what's genuinely expected. Um, and uh, so I have no silver, uh, no crystal ball for how that happens, but, you know, undoubtedly it was something that will, will happen over time. Um, I'm just going to switch to this topic of emissions and emissions targets for a minute. And many of you, I'm sure, know this, but for any who aren't quite as familiar, I just thought I'd explain that when companies are setting emissions reduction targets, um, they do it on what are called three different scopes. And our first scope is our own operations. So for Woolies, that's our trucks going back and forth to the DCs. Fonterra, it's running the big dryers that dry all the milk powder. Um, and then the second is our electricity, and Woolies is the, I think, 1%, uses 1% of Australia's electricity, so it's, you know, 5%, I guess, is pretty high compared to the others. But what you will undoubtedly notice from this slide is that the vast majority of these companies' emissions and many other companies are in what's called scope three, and that is the um, emissions that are generated in our supply chain. Uh, prior to or after our business operation. Um, our scope three is your scope one and two. Um, so what that means is that you will have seen and you will start to see very big companies um, become very interested in what you're doing and that's because you form our scope three emissions. Um, 
but that is actually, in my view, a good story. And um, I'm going to start just with the Fonterra journey because it's been really interesting. We, as a company, Fonterra, set targets um, for scope one and two, our own emissions, back as early as 2014, um, and then increased them in 2017. Um, and I don't, you can see there, actually the New Zealand government has mandated that everyone in New Zealand will be out of coal by 2037. So we as a company, Fonterra, are spending over a billion dollars to change over all of our operations um, to get them out of coal. So, you know, it's been a very much scope one, two focus. However, in 2021, um, the long-term aspiration or strategy that was laid out was to be leaders in sustainability um, because I think those of us in this part of the world with our uh, pastoral systems actually actually are already leaders in sustainability in, in many ways. Um, and we have talked to our farmers over the last year about setting a scope three target. So Fonterra's scope three is the farmer's emissions. Um, needless to say, that was a, you know, a journey. And um, we actually just announced those scope three targets um, two weeks ago, I think. And um, so, uh, why are we doing it? For the same reasons that I've talked about earlier. Our biggest customers, um, we, Fonterra, are part of their scope three emissions. They've set aggressive targets. They need Fonterra to get its emissions down. Um, good news is that a lot of those big customers there on the screen are actually starting to pay us premiums for our low carbon milk. Um, what's our approach? Working with farmers. Our target has not been rolled out to individual farmers, it's a company target. So we work through FarmSource, which is sort of, I guess, the equivalent of a nutrient or an elders, you know, that's our, our farmer engagement arm. We work with farmers and their farm environment plans, which lay out their emissions footprint and their initiatives um, on that and other environmental issues like water and so forth. Um, and then we as a co-op have the capability to invest at scale in solutions. So we're part of a $150 million government fund that's working on methane uh, reduction initiatives. So that's really the approach. Um, and all of my fellow farmer directors are on the road right as we speak um, with farmers talking about that 30% target. And what's been really helpful is to call out that actually 7% of that is actually good solid farming practices. And that's nothing new. It's like cattle rearing and grazing and water management and fertilizer optimization. All of those things today have the ability to reduce your carbon footprint. And then there's new technologies. And as I said, we're doing a lot of investment um, in new technologies. And the, the other one I want to call out is that first 8%, which gets us to the 30% target, which is land restoration and sequestration. That's because we, with our land, have the ability to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and to regenerate. Um, and so really once uh, our farmers have had the chance to look at the plan, it, it's actually very much gone from resistance to, okay, fine, great, what are the solutions? And, um, you know, I think to some extent listening to Jason, MLA is, is very much playing that role. Um, all right, so uh, this is really where I think that scope three story is, is beneficial because big players like Woolworths, are reviewing their scope three target, um, potentially will um, set a more aggressive target, but our intention is also to work with suppliers on measuring, reporting, education, and supply chain solutions. ANZ will be setting a sector pathway which is about reporting. It's not about um, financing or reductions, it's about reporting to just understand. And we'll also be working with the sector on solutions and nature positive investments. Um, Embryo is one of those solutions, and you know there's a lot of them out there, but I think they're very exciting, and the more you learn about those, the more confidence you get. Um, and uh, pollination, as I said, is working alongside um, big corporates to help draft these strategies for companies to help work with um, those in our supply chain and understand how we help co-invest and bring solutions to you. So, I mean, I think the scope three story largely is a really positive one from your perspective. Um, I'll just wrap up by talking uh, a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities and probably none of this is going to be very new to you but um, you know we're the sector also most uh, feeling the impact of climate um, but we um, have a lot of opportunity to work within our own farming system to, to mitigate that and um, Look, there's a great initiative called Farming for the Future that is actually working on 
uh, research into regenerative farming practices to, to, to show that they can be not only more regenerative but more productive. And I think the early day results are very promising. Um, point two is there's no silver bullet. That's obvious to all of us, but there are lots of solutions and you've got to start somewhere. And we just put in a solar, um, we've just gone solar in my own property and you know we're already seeing the benefits of that. So you know, it was a positive business case for us. Um, it's complex and you know there's no doubt in fact I myself have pulled up the MLA carbon calculator and filled out all the data and you know it's kind of an easy and early sort of first step to take in going on this journey um, so lot to play out but there's tools out there um, and you know MLA is a great place to start uh, I talked about foreign countries and investments that are being made in other um, parts of the world. That's true, there's a lot of money going in through the IRA, and Green New Deal and, and everything happening overseas. But Australian farmers and Kiwi farmers are already the most resilient, the most innovative, and you know are proactively engaging in solutions. So it's very promising. I just want to call out the um, the caution with solutions. You know, one of the things that's really important is that this space is moving so quickly. You really need to be educated. Um, you know, sometimes you can sell your reductions as offsets, but when companies come with scope three, we want to look at those reductions, and therefore, um, that's what's called insets. And I'm not the expert. There'll be lots of people today that can talk to you about this, but it's just—it's sort of saying the space is complex. I'm sure, you know that, but um, you know, I'm trying to educate myself every day because things are also changing every day. Um, and the last point, business models are unclear, is just the big who pays question, and I don't know the answer, and no one knows the answer. But I think the good news is that there are a lot of um, positive business cases, positive business models um, that, you know, are investments you can make in your farms that will make them more productive. Um, so I think at this stage of the game, um, it's uh, definitely reason to be optimistic. Um, so I am on my last slide. I know I'm just at time. Um, the question, uh, what's next, and literally the answer is what's next is a panel, and the panel is a panel of experts who do have, um, I think, a lot of good ideas and opportunities to share with you and a range of solutions. Um, but my what next is that, you know, I, I talk to other farmers. Um, as I said, MLA has a lot of expertise. There's great podcasts out there. There's so many ways um, to educate yourself. And I mean, I think it's great that you're here today and I'm really looking forward to the day um, to, to learn a bit more myself. So um, with that, I'd just like to thank you all for your time and attention. And I wanna thank Jason for inviting me. Um, I will be around all day if you have any questions. Um, I'll be easy to find. I'm the one in yellow, so I look forward to chatting with you later today. Thank you.